Good morning, Salem. What a joy it is to gather here again on our Wednesday night Bible study. We thank God for you and for God constantly to protect and to preserve you. Again, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Remember this year, 2021, our theme is God has more in store. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the things that the Lord has prepared for them that love him. And that thought, and in the fact that we're celebrating Black History Month, African American History Month, in which we celebrate the pride that we of African Americans have, to how God has blessed us and how God has kept us. I invite you to go to a scripture found in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 11. Shall we pray together? Father, we thank you for this time we share together. Bless us with insight. But Father, let us be responsible as we handle, dissect, and teach the word of God, that in everything we do, somebody may become a disciple, that somebody may be saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, now let us remember that Deuteronomy is what we call the collection of the books known as the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus, those five books written uh, through the inspiration of God, written by Moses. And in the book of Deuteronomy, you will see some of the uh, extra materials that you will see in the book of Exodus. Um, if you look at the Old Testament, when you read the book of Exodus and you read the book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, you're getting more details what goes on in the Exodus experience. The, Levit the book of Leviticus, the Levitical law. So when you see in the book of Exodus, as they build the tabernacle in the wilderness. In the book of Leviticus, you will see a lot of the priestly standards or the priestly rituals that were required. Deuteronomy and Numbers, you will find some of the more narratives about the battles, about Moses' interaction with the people. So we must understand when we read the Bible that we must read it in its subdivisions. When every time you look at a passage of scripture, you look at that verse in the context of a chapter, in the context of a book, in the context of the division of the books in the Old or the New Testament, and then finally has the scripture as a whole. For example, if I'm reading from the book of Deuteronomy, which we're going to do today, I must look at it in verse 11, in the context of chapter 6, in the context of the whole book of Deuteronomy, in the context of the Pentateuch, which describes the Exodus and the wilderness experience, and then in the context of the Old Testament, and then in the context of the whole Bible. This is, uh, will allow you to make sure that when you are interpreting the Word of God, you are doing it rightly. Remember one of the passages that Dr. Campbell used to drill in my head. Uh, Study to show thyself approved unto God, O workman, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And the book of Deuteronomy, again, has Moses is talking to the people. And he wants to remind them under the inspiration of God, not only how far God has brought them, but that God does not want them to forget what has happened. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land, whether ye go to possess it. God promised Abraham a land flowing with milk and honey in the book of Genesis. Again, we're in the Pentateuch. In the book of Genesis, God told Abraham, I'll give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Wherever where your foot steps, I will give you that land. They are preparing to go into that promised land, the land of Canaan. But God says, I want you not only to possess the land, but I also want you to remember the promise. Don't just possess what I'm giving you, but I want it, what you possess to be a reminder of the commandments that come along with you. You can't have a possession without a relationship. Too often what we do is that we rush to receive the possession that we forget the relationship. And you must understand, particularly spiritually speaking, when God gives you a, a possession, is to reinforce the relationship God has already had with you. 
possession relationship. But actually, it's relationship possession, number one and number two. Often we think the possession is number one. No, the relationship is number one. Abraham, I want to enter into a covenant relationship with you. Then I'm going to promise you a land. Moses, be in relationship with me. Then I'm going to make you a deliverer. You know, Jacob, be in relationship with me. Then I'm going to change your name to Israel and make you the father of a great nation. Be in relationship in order to get the possession. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I am the true vine. You are the branches. If you're connected to me, you shall produce fruit. Relationship, possession. Relationship, production. Relationship, blessing. Relationship, miracle. The woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus, him of his garment. He says, your faith has made you whole. Relationship, healing. That's the way scripture teaches us. Don't you forget. Don't just possess it and forget the commandment. Notice what verse 2 says. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God and keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded thee. That thou and thy sons and thy sons' sons and all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. God says, I want you to have a prolonged life and a prolonged inheritance. What I'm giving you is not just for your generations. It's for the next generation. And when he says for your son's sons, he's talking about perpetually. This will be a perpetual inheritance for all of the generations. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that thee may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that flows with milk and honey. Verses 1 through 3 is extremely important. If you're studying this scripture along with me, I want you to highlight a circle, uh, verses 1 through 3. That's the premise. That's the premise of what we're about to read. I would be remiss uh, as a Bible teacher if I don't point out verse number 1. Verse number 1 for the Jewish believer, Jewish faith, is probably the single most important passage in the Old Testament. It's verse number four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Probably the most important, profound, bedrock scripture for the Jewish faith. On the other hand, it's also a, what's causing them to stumble when it comes to the gospel. Because when we preach Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God, they will point you to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, that the Lord is one. You remember the Pharisees and the scribes saying, you are professing to be God. You are professing to be God's Son. The problem was this, this passage right here. The Lord is one. But let's go on. The Bible says very clearly, and it's in verse number 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee a great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not. I want you to hang your head right there. Which thou buildest not. So in verse 10, I want you to circle the word to give thee. To give thee. This is what God is going to do. Which thou buildest not. You don't have to build it. God is going to give it to you. Verse 11. And houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells dug, which thou duggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. When thou have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. I want to hang my head right there. Uh, even connecting to our thing that God has so much more in store for all of us. He has prepared it. He says, since I made the promise to Abraham, I have prepared for you a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you vineyards that you don't have to plant. And you remember, if you look in the book of Numbers, is that when they go into the promised land and they come back and tell Moses what they found, they found grapes, they found all manner of fruit. They said it was a goodly, of which was, was in other words, an agriculturally rich land. It was fertile. It was idea for farming, idea for agriculture. And he says, but there are giants in the land. 
And you remember they were afraid to go. But what we see here in the text, God says, when I give you houses that you didn't build, vineyards that you didn't plant, don't forget the Lord thy God. Why? It's because you didn't do it by yourself. Let's connect it to African American History Month. The reason why I can stand in this church at this time preaching on this platform is not because of my education, it's not because of my calling, it's not because of who I am, but it's about the generations preceding me. Our forefathers who fought for civil rights, our forefathers and abolitionists who helped in the freedom of the emancipation of slaves. We don't stand by ourselves, as Dr. Campbell said, we stand on the shoulders of giants who walk before us. One of the tragedies of the Old Testament and the tragedies of human history is when we forget that we have not made it by ourselves. It's when we forget the previous generations. You can never forget nor diminish the generations that have come before. Let me give you an Old Testament principle, a biblical principle of first things. In scripture, whatever preceded is greater. Okay? So the father is greater than the son. Why? Because the father preceded the son. If you look in the opening chapters of the gospel as recorded by St. John, when John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, I must decrease that he might increase. Because what? He was before me. He was before me. That's interesting because by human calculations, John the Baptist is older than Jesus. You remember, Elizabeth was already pregnant with John. And when Mary comes in, John leaps in the womb. John is older than Jesus. But John says, theologically and spiritually, he was before me. Speaking that he is divine. He was eternal. Before I was born, he was. That's why I am not greater than he is. The principles of first things. The principles of first thing applied to this month in which we live would challenge us that the reason why we are here is because great men and women came before us. The Fannie Lou Hammer, the W.B. Du Bois, the Booker T. Washington, the Malcolm X, the Marcus Garvey, you know? the Shirley Chisholms, all of these individuals made it possible. Let's look at where we stand. We stand currently with the first woman and the first African-American woman to be pre vice president of the United States. But Shirley Chisholm was the first woman, I mean first African-American woman to be elected to Congress and the first African-American woman to run for president. Because of the groundwork in which she laid, Vice President Harris is now standing on that, you see. And so you must understand there's always the principle of first. You, dealt, you have not made it nor arrived by yourself. He tells this generation that when you get into the promised land that I will show you, I want you to be aware that you did not make it by yourself. Why? Because for 430 years they had been in bondage. For 430 years, there have been generation after generation after generation that bore the burden of Egyptian slavery. Egyptian slavery. Here, when Jesus says, when God says, I'm about to bring you into this land, you got to remember, notice what he says in verse 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which I swear unto who? Thy fathers. The reason why you have it is because I made a covenant agreement with your fathers. Notice the fathers that he named. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Generations before you. Before even the book of Exodus. They were enslaved in, in Egypt for 430 years. Prior to that, even before that promise, God made a, before that, uh, that slavery, God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob. Of course, they had other sons as well. And so the lineage of the patriarchs of Israel comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name is later to change to Israel. So from Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob, 430 years of Egyptian bondage, and now to the point where they're getting ready to hopefully enter into the promised land. God said, I'm going to give you this land. You don't possess it yet. But when I give it to you, when you reap the benefits, realize that the benefits you're reaping is because of someone else's promise. Now that's profound. That the benefits you're reaping is because of someone else's promise. That's the point where he says the danger of forgetting is that you will take a possession but not realize the possession is attached to a promise. And the reason why one generation has the possession is because a previous generation received the promise. Let's look at it in terms of African American history. It was the promise made to our grandparents and our great grandparents about the emancipation that we now possess. You see? That's what we must understand. That's what we must understand. And he says, do not forget, verse 12, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the land of bondage. One thing I want you to never forget in the Old Testament, I really want you to highlight verse 12. That's what gets Israel in trouble every time, is they forget that it was God that brought them out of bondage. Why do they fall into idolatry? They forget that it was God that brought them out of bondage. Why do they constantly complain, let us go back to Egypt? It's because they forgot God brought them out of bondage. But if you look even closer, notice what they even remember. They tell Moses when they're hungry, in Egypt, we had lemons, we have onions, we had leeks, but we're starving in the wilderness and all God gives us is bread from heaven. <laughs> How profound is that? How preposterous is that? But then, notice, they, are, they remember the, the good things, but they forget the bondage. In that sense, you remember the onions and the leeks and the melons, but you forget that you were slaves. You see? We have to be very careful what we remember and what we forget. Sometimes we remember what we got, but we remember what we lost or the cost of it. You remember what you received, but you forgot the cost of it. Everything you receive has a cost. Everything you receive from the world has a cost. Everything you receive from God is because of a relationship. Don't forget the Lord thy God which brought you out of the land of Egypt. But I want to go back to verse 11 because I want you to highlight this part. The last sentence of the book uh, of verse 11 says, When thou shalt have eaten and be full. You get in danger of forgetting when you are full. It is not when you are empty. When you're empty, you easily remember. But it is when you are full, when you have eaten and be full, when you have eaten of the land, when you have possessed the land. The word full um, is a euphemism almost. When you are satisfied, when you are in the land and you have moved into the house and you have put the pictures on the wall, you have decorated the way you want to and you sit down and you recline on your sofa, put your feet up, you are relaxed, you are comfortable. That is the moment you forget the labor or who it was that brought you. When you get the car and you're driving, you forget what it took to get there. And even churches, when we build our churches, when we come back into the house of God, when we're able to gather again, the same thing applies. Don't forget that it was the Lord thy God that brought you from cold, through cold, from the land of bondage. This time in which we celebrate African American History Month, let us remember that we stand on the shoulders of giants. We stand on people who broke the color barrier. We stand on people who was the first one to enter higher education. We stand on the shoulders of the people who integrated public school. We stand on the shoulders of those who, who face ridicule and, and taunting and abuse so that you can eat where you want to, sit where you want to, buy what you want to. Somebody had to go first. The proceeding is greater than what comes next. Remember the principle of first thing. It is not that you diminish your impact on society, but you remember that you stand not because of your own strength, but because of the strength of others. 
because of the strength of others. And so what God is trying to tell us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12, is don't forget it was the Lord your God who brought you from the house of bondage. You haven't made it this far by yourself. They used to sing a song, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? That's, that, that's the story. What is the gospel? If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? There's a danger in forgetting what God has done. I hope this message blessed you. I, don't, don't catch me looking at my watch. I want to make sure that I didn't take too much of your evening from you, but I want you to understand very clearly and closely. There's a danger of forgetting. There's a danger of the people of God forgetting that our possession is based on our relationship. Let's review. Relationship precedes possession. My possession is based on my relationship. What God gives me is because I'm in relationship with him. And if you want God to give you more, you have to stay connected to him. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, then you can produce much fruit. But the moment you sever your connection with God, and how do we sever our connection with God? By forgetting that it was God that has brought us out of the land of Egypt. That's it, possession, relationship. When do I forget? That's verse 11, when I've eaten and I've become full. The moment I sit back and relax, I'm at my most vulnerable. Is because now my mind says it was by my own strength that I have made it. Which is the greatest lie that has ever been told. Well, one of them. It is not by your strength that you made it, but it was because of the law. And remember the principle of first thing. The previous generation is greater than the next generation. It never diminished the generations that are coming on. I'm hoping that my son, that my children are greater than I am in terms of their accomplishments, in terms of their influence, in terms of their education and their profession. I want them to reach higher than I have, but they must realize that the reason why they're able to do what they are able to do is because their father and mother, and it's the reason why I am able to do what I am able to do is because my parents, and the reason why my parents were the first generation to go to college is because of their parents, and all of these things, back, 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 and back. That's what it's all about. Particularly as we celebrate African American History Month, I want you to remember that you stand on the shoulders of great men and women who may not have had the greatest education, but they broke barriers. They were the first to integrate. They were the first to attain doctorate degrees at some of the most prestigious universities in this country. They were the first to, uh, to drive trucks in, in white-owned companies. They were the first to move past being domestic workers. They were the first who worked hard to put their children to school. It, they were the first to do that. And that's what it's all about. So I want you to take time to reflect upon those who have come before you and take time to remember that as we celebrate our awesome history, we stand not because of ourselves, but we stand on the shoulders of great men and great women. May God bless you. May God keep you is my prayer. Father, we thank you for this time we share together. Continue to bless the people of God. That as we continue to study the word of God, that we will do so responsibly, but with a thirst for knowledge. Let us not remember when we are full and heavy that we forget that it is because of you that we live, we move, and we have our being. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember the Salem Church. God has more in store. We are disruptive, but not distracted. Good evening.